Thank you very much, baby. Common. Senator Engel, ladies, gentlemen. I want to express uh, Senator Engel's and my appreciation to you for coming out uh, this morning. And uh, looking at all you ladies and seeing what you've done with some of your distinguished office holders, I recall a, uh, an experience of the suffragettes who picketed the White House back during the First World War. The leader of the suffragettes was arrested. And as she was taken away in a truck, she turned to her girls <laughs> and said, uh, don't worry, girls. Pray to the Lord. She'll protect you. <laughs> I uh, want to uh, express our thanks to you, those of us who hold public office, to those of you who make it possible. And I want to say uh, one or two words about uh, why I think what you're doing is important and why I think what Senator Engel and Senator Mansfield and your state offices and state legislatures, what they're doing is important. Woodrow Wilson once said that, uh, what use is a political party unless it's being served and used by the nation for some great purpose. So the question really which both political parties must constantly face, what purpose do we serve? What good are we doing the nation? Of all the problems that face us at home and abroad, how is our party, whether we're Democrats or Republicans, how are we measuring up? What is our program? What are the needs of the country? And what are we doing about them? Now the Democratic Party has answered that question with remarkable success in every generation. And the result has been, the result has been that what was regarded as controversial and dangerous and new, from the time of Thomas Jefferson and Jackson and Cleveland and Wilson and Roosevelt and Truman, we now almost take for granted. So the question that we have is, in the 1960s, whether we as Democrats, and I think that the citizens who are Republicans might well ask themselves the same question. What are we doing in 1960s to meet the problems that this country now faces at home and abroad? Well, let me first just say briefly what I think our problems are. When we came into office in 1961, we faced three or four very serious problems on the home front, and we've been attempting to deal with them. Not wholly successfully, but we've been recognized the problems and are now trying to develop solutions. The basic fact was that we faced entirely different problems and in many ways more complex problems and more sophisticated problems and more sensitive problems than we did in the 1930s, even though they were not as dramatic and not as immediately dangerous. We had, since 1957, been moving through a period of almost chronic sluggishness in our economy. And in the last three years of the 1950s, we had passed through two recessions from which we had emerged in each case weaker. In addition, it was recognized in the 1960s that there was about to pour onto the labor market millions of young men and women who were born in the post-war baby boom, many of whom were unskilled at a very time when machines were throwing other men out of work. So it was recognized that we had to find a system of providing over 25,000 new jobs a week in order to take care of the people coming into the labor market and in order to take care of the people that machines were throwing out of work. This is a difficult, complex, and unsolved problem, but one which requires our attention and one uh, which requires our solution. We have proposed a number of solutions. And I must say that nearly every one of them has been opposed by the Republican Party. What we've done is this. We have provided retraining for those who are chronically unemployed. We reduce the retirement age for women from 65 to 62 that, so that some women can move out of the labor market. We've increased the minimum wage and expanded its coverage. We have taken a whole variety of steps to deal with those areas of chronic depression. 
For example, we give assistance now in the Area Redevelopment Bill to those areas in West Virginia and Eastern Kentucky and Southern Illinois, particularly the old coal towns, where 15 or 20 or 25 percent of the people have been out of work for three, four, and five years. This is one phase of the problem, the chronic unemployables, we might call. Retraining, concentrated attention by the national government, and all the rest. In addition to that, however, we face the problem of our entire economy. And for that reason, we have proposed a reduction this year, which will take place over a period of 18 months of our taxes by $10 billion on the assumption, and I think a proven assumption, that the taxes which were passed during the Second World War and in Korea put such a drain on our economy that as we moved into a recession and moved out of it, the burden of that taxation strangled the recovery and we moved from recession to recession with higher and higher rates of unemployment. If we are able, with a tax cut that we are now talking about, to move to the end of this year at the present rate of economic recovery from the end of 1960, this will be the longest period of recovery from a recession which has taken place since the Civil War. And if we move through 64 and 65 and 66, which I believe we can, with perhaps rather slight reductions, if any, this will be a unique record in the history of the United States. I think we have a chance. I know all the arguments against it because I've heard them over and over again. But the fact of the matter is that we in the United States face the same problem as Great Britain does with a conservative government. Last spring, this spring, the conservative government came forward with a tax cut even larger than ours, with a balance of payment problem even more substantial than ours, and it was able to pass in a few days. We've been fighting it out month after month, listening to speeches against this program, which I regard as essential, even though it's complicated, even though it isn't immediately appreciated by the people to talk about a tax cut at a time of deficit. But we are either going to have this program, I can assure you, or we're going to move into a recession as we have in the 1950s when we moved through three of them. And we cannot afford to move from recession to recession with an unemployment rate of 5.7, 8, and 6 percent, and then move into another recession and come out of that recession with an unemployment rate of 7 percent, and then move along and stagger along for 24 months and move into another recession and come out of that with an unemployment rate of 8 and 9 percent. We are going to have, coming into the labor market two years from now, one million more young boys and girls than we have this year. So we are faced with very complicated problems, which require complicated solutions. It's not as easy as it was in the 1930s, in a sense, to talk about minimum wage and Social Security, the old slogans. Now we have a complicated economy, a rich and prosperous country, but we have serious problems which many of our citizens do not notice, but which press upon us and can make the difference between a society which blooms and blossoms and is an ornament to the free world, or one which falls behind Western Europe and Japan and all the other countries which eight or nine years ago were the object of our assistance. I think the job can be done, but it requires new tools because the problems are new. And I can assure you that your congressional delegation, and I mean this as a fact, and Senator Engel have been strongly behind all of the efforts we've made to deal with a sluggish economy in a dynamic world. And I think we have every chance to be successful. Another area where we need help is in education. I made a speech about it in San Diego two days ago. And then I went out on the Kitty Hawk, and for some reason they delivered the morning paper out there, and I read the statement of a distinguished Republican from San Diego saying this is the most extraordinary demand that the President of the United States would consider that the federal government had a responsibility in this field. He has not read the Northwest Ordinance where Thomas Jefferson and John Adams in the 1780s set aside in every 30 sections one section for the knowledge of our people. He has not followed his great leader, President Lincoln, who passed at the height of the Civil War the Land Grant Act, which makes your universities, state universities, and every state university, which started them all, 
and made it possible for them to survive and endure. Look at these figures of what we're going to be dealing with in the 1960s. We have 23 million Americans over 18 years of age with less than eight years of schooling. What kind of work are they going to find? How are we going to get them a job in this modern age? But we need a research assistant, we need teachers, we need nurses, we need doctors. We need people who are well-trained, well-qualified. This isn't the 1900s when millions of immigrants came in with no skills except an ability to lift. Now we can lift ourselves with machines and we have 23 million with less than eight years of schooling and eight million with less than five years. What kind of citizens are they going to be? And they're coming out to California. This isn't a problem. <laughs> I hear people say, well, this isn't our problem. This is the problem of X state or Y state. But Americans can get in a car and drive. And they're going to come here, not to Massachusetts, unfortunately, so much, but they're coming. Imagine having eight million people in this rich country of ours, less than five years of education. So we have set up an education bill to make it possible to assist bright young men and women to get PhDs because we need it at the top, to get graduate degrees. We're going to have to double the number of our college dormitories, so we're going to have loans and grants for the construction of college dormitories, to give assistance so that we can raise teachers' salaries. This state does as well as any better than any state in the union. But the old slogans which we heard in the 30s about this great hand of the federal government reaching out, we hear it all. But unless we recognize that this is not, these aren't 50 separate states, but one nation and an uneducated boy. And if you can tell me what's economical about having an uneducated boy or girl come in to the labor community, you have about five, six, seven or eight years to get him. Unless you educate him then, you'll never educate him. He'll be around for 30 or 40 years. If it costs you $500 in this state per year, per student, and you can educate him and perhaps send him to college if he has the capability, or otherwise he's out in the labor market year after year, probably on relief, probably on unemployment compensation, bringing up children who themselves will be uneducated. If you can imagine a greater waste, that those are the real uh, spenders who make it impossible to educate boys and girls at the crucial time. Do you know that in some states, in some states, 40% of the non-white population have less than five years of school, 40% or 7% of the white population. We had a federal civil service exam, the basic exam for getting a job in the government taken in the South recently. 1,400 Negroes applied, 80 passed, 80 passed not their fault, but how can they pass if 40% of them have had less than five years in school and they vote, they're citizens, their power at the poll, which is the basic power in this democracy, is equal to any PhD, and anyone thinks it's economical and wise and frugal and prudent not to make it possible for them to be educated, at least to make the best of their talents, which is all we want in this country. So there's a lot of unfinished business here and abroad. Will you tell me why this rich country of ours should have 3% of our children mentally retarded while Sweden has 1%? The reason, of course, is that they grow up in slums, that the mothers don't have prenatal care, they don't have special teachers, all the things which will make it possible for us. And we have set up the largest program in the history of this country, which has passed the Senate and will pass the House to make it possible for us to cut our statistics down from 3% who are mentally retarded, I hope down to a figure which they've reached already in some sections of Western Europe. But once again, I do not regard that as wasteful. I do not regard that as wasteful. I'm not impressed by that argument. To retrain a man, to educate a child, to give security to an older citizen, to find jobs for those who want to work, this country of ours is rich and cannot afford to do it, and can't afford to do it, and I'm confident will do it, 
because the people of this country cannot possibly turn their backs upon history and expect that we are going to continue to be the leaders of the free world unless we make this society of ours a dynamic one. And we have to do at home what we're trying to do through the Alliance for Progress and the Peace Corps and our trade program and the disarmament agency and our concentration. And I think we've made some progress. There was a meeting of all the African states at Addis Ababa recently. It came at the worst time of the Birmingham crisis when all the pictures were in all the papers of the world. Only one African leader criticized the United States because I think they realized that we have a long way to go. And there is a good deal of unfinished business which we've inherited and about which we've perhaps done too little. But I think at least it's understood in Africa, as it must be in the United States, that we are going to meet our responsibility in the 1960s to provide equality of opportunity to give every child, regardless of his color, a fair chance. So I want to tell you that when you work for a political party in the 1960s, and particularly when you work for the Democratic Party, you are not engaging in a social activity. This is not a means of meeting together, and this is not a club. This is an organization, an institution, a system for bringing our political policy, our views on the great problems we face at home and abroad. And I must say, after looking at this country and the Congress for the last two and a half years, if I ever had any doubts about which party stands for progress, which party recognizes the problems of the country in the 1960s, I don't have it today. It is the party of which we are a member, the Democratic Party. We have a bill before the House Rules Committee the other day to help in beginning mass transit, which our cities are going to need. Distinguished Republican congressman said to Congressman Patton from Ohio, said to Congressman Patman from Texas, who was testifying in favor of the bill, he said, what are you from Texas interested in helping the people of New York solve their traffic problem? And the congressman from Texas said, I'm interested because this is the United States and the people of Texas are as involved with the people of New York as the people of New York must be with the people of Texas. This idea that we are 50 separate countries, that the federal government does not have a responsibility to set a tone and a standard and an example, whether it's in transit or libraries or retardation or education, whether it's in space or on the ground or under the earth, the national government representing the will of 180 million people must move ahead, must meet its responsibilities. And all those who say go home are those who have permitted this country to stagnate during years of our past history. So we're in good company today. All I want to say is we've got a long way to go, and I want you to come with us. Thank you. Thank you.